minutes and then probably we'll pass on to our minister to speak so that he has enough time to speak his mind and then finish. Is that okay, Honorable Minister? It's okay. Very good. Very good. Okay. Uh, I can see who else. Um, Yes, sir. I can see. Yes, sir, from SCI. Yes, sir. Unmute. Okay, yes, you are sir. there. Okay. Is Shubroto with us? Yes, sir. Shubroto sir also joined soon. He's uh, in outside. He's joined soon. Very okay. good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before we formally start, uh, uh, Professor Debor, uh, is for your knowledge that we have had uh, a number of participants from the private sector uh, in Bangladesh who deal with these agri-machineries. They are largely in agri-business. Their major stake is in local machinery. And we have representative from SCI Motors uh, who is dealing with these tractors and now there's uh, Yanmar from Mine Harvester. We have Sadid Jamil from yeah, Metal. Um, they are also a big company dealing with these tractors. Um, then Harvester. Uh, Sadid, what is the name of your Harvester? I think I saw one. If, FM World Brand, sir. FM, FM World Brand. Chinese one? Yes, sir. Okay. Right. If you permit me, I, I just want to say one thing. It would be great if someone from the different agribusiness innovator sectors joined us. If they put their details details in, in the chat box, then we will make an agritech. Uh, uh, we are planning to do some agritech uh, uh, initiatives in Bangladesh for value chains and the on farm. So it would be great to connect in future how we can better solve the issues. Uh, so it would be great to have their details. Thank you, sir. Excellent, excellent, um, Abdullah. Um, Abdullah Al Mamun is doing his PhD under the supervision of Professor Lohenberg Dibor of Harper Adams University. So um, he's the one really who is acting as a kind of go between really in organizing these uh, meetings and, and seminars. So thank you very much, uh, Al Mamun. And um, so, so the private sector, if you could uh, uh, detect some of the points in your chat box, uh, that, would, that would be great really. But that doesn't mean that you won't speak. Type our means you will speak. Okay, Hasneen, shall we start now? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, it's very good. Do, do. Go ahead. Um, honorable Chief Guest, respected moderator and presenter, academicians and researchers from different countries, students and all other, good evening to you all. Uh, to uh, today's webinar on agri-tech key to sustainable intensification of smallholder agriculture in Bangladesh. Uh, we are very happy that uh, our Honorable Minister of Agriculture, uh, Dr. Mohammad Abdul Raja, kindly agreed to be with us as chief guest to this mm -hmm. webinar. Uh, so we are very grateful to him that uh, he managed his time uh, uh, despite of his very tight and busy schedule. Uh, uh, we are grateful to him for that. He's not only the Minister of Agriculture, but also a great scientist, uh, agricultural scientist and a uh, 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 policy maker for the country. So his presence is definitely important to us uh, to make an impact uh, uh, from our webinar uh, to a broader aspect. 
Uh, we are also uh, very uh, grateful to our moderator's side, who is continuously taking the pain to uh, run this webinar since 2020 on behalf of the Department of Agricultural Economics, Bangladesh Agricultural University. Uh, so uh, uh, we are grateful to our sir, uh, and I'm happy that uh, uh, for this uh, we are having chance uh, opportun and opportunity to meet and learn from the renowned scientists from all over the world. And uh, uh, certainly uh, today's uh, main attractions, uh, Professor uh, James Debor, uh, uh, James Debor from the Harper Adam University, UK, who is the pioneer researchers of the uh, precision agriculture and agritech uh, economics. So we are eagerly waiting to hear and learn from you. Uh, definitely uh, your, uh, from your presentation. Presentations, uh, we can learn <coughs> something that we can apply uh, in the context of Bangladesh, and we are look, uh, looking forward to work together in future also. That uh, the um, knowledge of this uh, uh, UK, US, uh, I mean, the developing uh, developed countries, we can uh, uh, try, we'll try to apply in our developing country context. So, uh, and uh, so I welcome uh, each of you to this webinar from different sectors from the department on behalf of the Department of Agricultural Economics. And uh, uh, hopefully, um, uh, hopefully we can enjoy th throughout the sessions from, the, uh, from Professor James. And with these few words, I would like to request our moderator, sir, to, uh, uh, to continue and run this rest of the session. Over Thank to you very sir. much. Thank you very much, uh, Madam um, Asmin Jahan. It's a pleasure that um, we have been able to continue this webinar program for about now three years. Um, I'm very pleased about it, really. So Honorable uh, Minister of Agriculture, Dr. Abdul Rajak, um, and uh, the very senior most minister uh, in the cabinet of about over 40 uh, ministers. So he is one of the senior ministers. Um, and it's our additional pleasure that he is an agricultural scientist and a specialized agronomist. He understands the biology, uh, of uh, crop science and crops. And he has a tremendous exposure on farming system research during the time that he was at the Bangladesh Agricultural Research Council on a farming system division, really. So the inner masses of the seminar that the sustainable intensification of smallholder agriculture in Bangladesh could probably the uh, most relevant subject and topic from our honorable minister as well. Um, so thank you very much, honorable minister, for being with us. Um, thank you also. Uh, uh, welcome, uh, Professor Lewenberg de Boer. Um, that this is your second presentation in a span of how oh, many? Uh, two months or three months period. And it's very nice of you that you have cared to share your research experience with us in the agricultural economics specifically, but largely the agriculture community. Also, with these private sector industry people who are the key um, institutions to bring these machines, um, distribute these machines um, to us. So they are here with us. We have with us our postgraduate students and our colleagues uh, from BAU and from other universities, both in Bangladesh and beyond Bangladesh. Really. I can see Professor um, Uttam Dev 
from the United States, uh, one of my brilliant students, uh, who has also joined, and there are many. I don't see the whole screen immediately, but whoever uh, you are with us, very welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Our uh, concern today is food security, uh, cost escalation due to the price hike in the input market, particularly the fossil fuel and fertilizer. So our concern is how to reduce this cost and how to bring about efficiency and precision in agriculture so, so that the unit cost of production comes down and the services from the machineries can be even more affordable to our smallholder agriculture. So with this expectation and concentration of mind, I would now um, say, a few words about Professor Lowenberg Debor's background. Uh, Professor uh, holds the Elizabeth Crick Chair in Agritech Applied Economics at Harper Adams University in the UK. He's responsible for economics in the hands free farm team at Harper Adams. He's also co editor of the journal a very prestigious journal, Precision Agriculture, and past president of the International Society of Precision Agriculture. His research focuses on the economics of agricultural technology, especially precision agriculture and crop robotics. Loenberg Deborse's research and outreach is founded in hands-on experience in agriculture. That's very interesting, hands-on experience in agriculture, including production of maize and soybeans in a um, Iowa state in the USA. And a very recent uh, testimony uh, to Professor Lowenberg de Boer's um, contribution is that only a week ago, he spoke and participated in a meeting which submitted an action plan to boost productivity and innovation in British agriculture. And he was one of the members of the team who has prepared that report at the House of Lords. And his, his comment, one comment I could get from the website um, is very interesting and attractive. Uh, I think he mentions that food security is essential for a functional modern society. He doesn't only say that it's essential for modern society. He says a functional modern society. Later on, if time permits, I would like to hear from you, him why this adjective function is added <laughs> for a modern society. So with this um, little introduction about you, uh, Professor Loenberg Debors, floor is yours. So please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mandal and uh, Honorable Minister, uh, Dr. Haseen uh, Johan, representatives of uh, industry, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure uh, to be with you uh, this afternoon. And let me share my screen and we'll um, get to the subject uh, at hand. So, can you... Can you see my screen now? Yes, I can, and probably all others. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Thank you very much. And um, <clears throat> let's see. It, uh... So to start with, let's start with a perspective on 
uh, productivity, agricultural productivity worldwide, and what uh, have been the major factors uh, in, in that productivity. And that's why I show you uh, the chart uh, on, on this slide, which shows you the annual growth uh, in agricultural productivity, which you know, earlier than uh, the 1970s, it was uh, mostly uh, additional inputs uh, in, in agriculture. Uh, if you go back in history, it was mostly adding land, uh, then it was uh, fertilizer, pesticides, and so on. Uh, but since uh, about uh, 1990, uh, the major portion of the growth in agricultural productivity uh, is the, the improvement in what economists call total factor productivity. That means using the existing inputs better. It's a green part of that uh, bar in each one of the, the uh, decades shown uh, in the chart. And this is where agritech comes in because agritech, precision agriculture, uh, agrobotics are all things that help uh, farmers and producers uh, do a better job of producing uh, with uh, the limited resources that uh, we know we have. So the objectives uh, here today and honorable minister, I hope to move through this quickly so we can get to the questions and comments. Um, number one, to outline briefly how Agritech is improving agricultural sustainability worldwide. Uh, number two, to summarize how that technology in the, in the pipeline can make agriculture even more environmentally and, and economically sustainable. Uh, number three, um, to uh, give a vision of how high-tech agriculture is available to smallholder farmers. And then fourthly, to uh, look at some specific directions for improving sustainability in Bangladesh. Uh, the, the two photos in this slide are illustration of uh, the scale issues that I, I think are, are key. The top photo is a, um, a uh, nitrogen sensor, a handheld sensor that can be used on uh, any size of farm. And the lower photo is exactly the same sensor, but that sensor is now mounted on uh, a large uh, expensive piece of equipment used for treating uh, large uh, areas of crop uh, in, in the United States. So that particular technology can be used uh, by small scale agriculture or by large scale. Uh, and that's true of, of many uh, agritech uh, innovations. So what is sustainable agriculture? Um, and at least in Europe and in North America, Agricultural sustainability is often thought of as going back to traditional practices like the one uh, shown in the photo there. But it's important to realize that those practices were not even uh, were not necessarily sustainable when they were done and, and perhaps even less so now. Uh, one of the uh, primary definitions of sustainability comes from the 1987 Brundtland Report which defines sustainability as the ability to meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet uh, their, their own needs. So sustainability, agricultural sustainability uh, is, is not defined in terms of technology, but in terms of outcomes. And those outcomes include uh, improved uh, food security, um, it includes reduced environmental footprint and includes healthy uh, rural communities. Some other definitions that are useful, uh, sustainable intensification uh, is defined uh, as a process or system where agricultural yields are increased without adverse environmental impact and without conversion of additional non-agricultural land. Precision agriculture uh, the definition there comes from the International Society and focuses on uh, improving temporal and spatial management uh, of, uh, of farmland uh, and agriculture to improve sustainability and, and production. Smart farming is a broader term and refers to managing farms using technologies like 
Internet of Things, robotics, drones, AI, to increase the, the quantity and quality of products while optimizing human labor. And similarly, digital agriculture is a fairly broad uh, term that uh, is the seamless integration of di digital technologies into crop and livestock uh, management. So some of those key technologies are ones that I've spent now uh, several decades working on, uh, global navigation satellite systems, so GNSS or the American system, which is GPS, uh, geographic information systems, uh, satellite, aerial, and remote, uh, uh, remote sensing, uh, soil sensors and other proximate sensors, variable rate technology, often used, uh, referred to by the acronym VRT for seed, fertilizer, pesticides, and big data, especially pooling data for management uh, insights. If we broaden that a bit to smart farming or digital agriculture, where we would include Internet of Things, uh, blockchain, and that might especially be useful for traceability, uh, digital phenotyping, which is very useful in, in plant breeding and uh, precision livestock farming. So if we think about some of those specific technologies, uh, GNS light bars, as in the photo there, uh, were the first step in, in automated guidance. They were first commercialized in Australia in 1997 and very quickly spread to uh, North uh, and South America and later uh, later to Europe. Um, auto steer technology uh, takes uh, that uh, light bar technology one more step so that the human operator uh, is now mainly uh, on the tractor in case there's a, a, a problem. So the, it's turning over the, the guidance and the, the driving of the, the equipment uh, to the computer. Auto steer has been one of the most rapidly and most widely adopted agricultural technologies in history. So if we look at uh, the North American case, auto steer was introduced uh, in uh, North America in 2003. And by about 2012, 2013, uh, it was uh, standard practice for most uh, mechanized farmers and for, uh, for agribusness. GNS guidance affects sustainability mainly through reducing skip and overlap so that the application of uh, inputs, so it could be fertilizer, seed, pesticide, uh, is more accurate. The growth in guidance has facilitated some related technologies like sprayer boom control and planter uh, row shutoffs. And you can see in the drawings below how um, using a, a large, when using a large piece of equipment, uh, the um, boom control can shut off um, application in areas where uh, it's not needed, and then turn it on again on a on a row by row uh, or or section by section uh, basis. Variable rate technology uh, aims to. Um, uh, put the, the right input in the right amount in the right place at the right time. Uh, it's usually guided by a map like the one you see uh, in, uh, in the slide there, so that the colors there uh, are uh, different rates of um, application uh, that might be uh, in, in a field. And uh, it's amazing that uh, there's very variation even in, in really quite quite small fields sometimes. Uh, yield mapping has been a key uh, technology in precision agriculture. Uh, it started with uh, mapping for uh, grains and oil seeds, but it's been extended to most mechanically harvested crops. So the, the photo there uh, is from uh, a sugarcane mapping um uh, in uh, in Colombia in uh, in South America and yield mapping gives farmers site specific feedback on crop production practices it it identifies those areas that are doing well and those areas that maybe uh need uh need some attention uncrewed aerial vehicles uavs or also called drones are 
are essentially flying robots and they're used in, in a wide variety of ways. Uh, in, in many countries, they're used mainly for data collection and site specific. Uh, and in some places, they're being increasingly used for site specific input uh, application. They can also be used to manage extensive grazing livestock, as in the photo uh, in, in this slide. Autonomous mobile uh, crop machines, also called uh, robots, um, are coming on the market, but there's no agreement yet on what uh, those uh, robots will look like. So if you look at the upper left corner from some uh, large uh, machine manufacturers, you see uh, large traditional equipment, uh, but just without uh, the cab and the steering wheel and, and the driver. Uh, on the other hand, in the center there, there's many researchers think that once you take the driver off of the, the machine, there is no reason to have large machines. And so you could have swarms of smaller uh, machines that do the same work, but uh, have benefits like reducing compaction and uh, being more reliable because if you have many machines, then even if one is down for maintenance, uh, the others can keep working. On uh, the right, you see a picture from Hands Free Farm uh, at Harper Adams, which is retrofitted conventional equipment. And retrofitted equipment uh, has the benefit that uh, it usually has a switch that can switch between manual and automated. And so when the equipment has to be moved from field to field, uh, it can be switched to manual and driven there. Whereas uh, OEM uh, uh, robots uh, need to be uh, moved on a trailer or in some other way. And then uh, in the lower left-hand corner, you see the DOT uh, machines from uh, Canada, which look very different from uh, any current uh, conventional, uh, conventional equipment. Robots affect sustainability mainly by making uh, highly site-specific data collection and management economically feasible. So there's many things that as farmers, we don't do in, uh, in commercial agriculture uh, because they're just too much work and uh, robotics has the potential uh, to change that. So the vision for sustainable food and farming in the United Kingdom, so let's talk about the United Kingdom before we get to, to, to Bangladesh, uh, we see more small and medium-sized farms because uh, ag tech changes the economies of scale in agriculture. We see review, reduced use of fertilizers and pesticides because uh, we can make better use of those fertilizers and pesticides that we use and we can enhance natural systems. Uh, farms will be more directly linked to processors and consumers, so more likely that uh, the farmer will deal directly with uh, the end user of the product. We see farmers devoting most of their time to management, strategy, marketing, and entrepreneurship, not doing manual work or operating equipment. The, the idea that a farmer should spend all of his or her, her time driving a tractor up and down fields uh, is uh, something that uh, is uh, receding into the past. Uh, the vision includes more biodiversity within farm businesses and a wider range of enterprises from farm to farm as they become more specialized. And one of the key, key uh, parts of the vision is that farming on rolling topography with many small irregularly shaped fields, which is characteristic of the United Kingdom and most of Northern Europe, becomes economically viable again because uh, swarm robots um, can farm those fields uh, just as cost efficiently uh, as they can farm uh, large rectangular fields. So if we think about the opportunities for sustainability that are in the pipeline, uh, one of the key opportunities is on-the-go sensors uh, and fertilizer application. So if we look at app, uh, adoption uh, data, we see that, that variable rate fertilizer um, has lagged compared to some other agritech technologies like guidance. Uh, and we think that's because uh, the current technology is still knowledge intensive. 
requires human in intervention at, at several points and yields only modest benefits. The most likely technical solution is on-the-go fertilizer uh, sensing and application uh, that embodies knowledge in uh, computer algorithms and reduces the need for human intervention. Uh, combining on-the-go sensors with other data uh, that of, on characteristics that influence crop uh, response capacity, so soil depth, um, previous yield, so on, can fine tune that application. Currently, most of that technology is for nitrogen application, but uh, it could easily be developed for uh, phosphate, uh, potassium, lime, and micronutrients. Uh, it's important to note that the technology is most accurate with liquid uh, fertilizer, but can also be used uh, with, with granular uh, fertilizers. Another opportunity for sustainability is machine vision to individualize uh, pest control to the plant and insect level. So you see there in the photos, there are, uh, again, two scales, uh, multiple scales of this that can be used. The upper uh, photo is the, the John Deere Blue River Sea and Spray technology, which is uh, a large piece of, of kit uh, attached to uh, a tractor with a, uh, a human driver, and below uh, it's a small uh, autonomous uh, sprayer, um, a robotic sprayer, if, if you will. So the future there is instead of applying pesticides broadcast, spraying everywhere all over the field, uh, it's the idea of putting the pesticides only where they're needed. So the idea of putting a few drops of a herbicide on a specific weed and a specific herbicide because we know that herbicide is effective against that species of weed. So that all becomes possible with machine vision and with robotics. Some of the benefits that are expected from, from crop robotics are, and the discussion of crop robotics always starts with easing of farm labor, uh, constraints which occur all over the world, um, uh, not just in industrialized countries, uh, reduced farm equipment investments, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, uh, reducing and maybe eventually eliminating herbicide use uh, by targeted spraying and mechanical weed control, biodiversity increase because robots can facilitate farming small irregularly shaped fields, and then an aspect that many people miss, uh, and that's the potential for rural entrepreneurship uh, in organic production and other enterprises with uh, high labor uh, requirements. So in uh, Europe, uh, robots are starting uh, to appear in crop fields. Uh, weeding robots are being trialed all over Europe. Uh, led by France, and in 2020, about 150 robots were being used for mechanical weeding, mostly of vegetable and sugar beet crops in France. Um, worldwide, the agricultural robot market was estimated uh, at almost $5 billion uh, US dollars in 2021. Uh, the Future Farming Crop Robot Catalog in 2021 had uh, 48 robots being marketed by 31 medium and small manufacturers, plus two companies with tractors that can be operated autonomously, and six companies with retrofit kits to convert conventional tractors uh, for autonomous use. The 2022 Future Farming Crop Robot Catalog actually uh, says that there's 250 companies worldwide that are developing robots. Uh, not all of them are on the market yet, but uh, they're, in, they're in the pipeline. In North America, both John Deere and CNH are commercializing autonomous uh, crop equipment. In the photo here, you see Roboti, which is produced by the Agro Intelli company from Denmark, uh, weeding uh, French beans on uh, Sandfield Farm, Stratford on Avon. So part of the, 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 the results of uh, economic analysis of crop robot use indicates that uh, it can reduce the cost of production and change the shape of the cost curve. So these are cost curves for wheat production in the UK 
that were estimated uh, based on the hands-free hectare experience at Harper Adams University. And the two things you should note about those cost curves. So these are cost curves uh, by size of farm, uh, all the way from uh, 66 uh, hectare farm, which is the average in the United Kingdom to a 500 hectare farm. Uh, and this is a range that would be quite typical in the UK. Uh, the blue line is the cost curve for wheat production uh, with conventional uh, equipment. And the labels at each node are the horsepower of the tractor in uh, the machinery set. So the smallest farms are using a 38 horsepower tractor and the largest farm in this uh, study is using an almost 300 horsepower tractor. And that's typical uh, with conventional equipment that as farm size grows larger and larger uh, tractors are being used. The orange cost curve is uh, producing wheat, but with robotic technology. And uh, the hands-free hectare used a swarm uh, robot idea where it used, it increased the number of, um, of robot units as farm size increased. So the, the smallest farm size here used one robot unit and uh, the larger farm sizes then used uh, two or three. The two important things to, to note about these cost curves is the orange cost curve is substantially lower, meaning that uh, with robots, it's possible to produce wheat uh, and other products at a substantially lower level. And, and the estimates here are 20 to 30 pounds per metric ton uh, of, of wheat. Uh, and in a commodity crop, that's uh, very, very uh, significant. Perhaps an even more important issue is the fact that the robotic cost curve flattens out at a much smaller farm size. So in this particular uh, case, uh, after the, the second uh, node there, which is I think about a, a 180 um, hectare farm, uh, the cost curve uh, flattens out, uh, meaning that uh, there's, there's, there's no longer economies of scale reasons for uh, increasing farm size. Now, we don't know that a 38 horsepower uh, robot is the ideal. Uh, it just happened to be that's, that's what uh, we had available uh, at, um, at Harper Adams when, when the hands-free farm was uh, developed, but it might be larger or it might be smaller. This is the slide that when I talk with uh, farmers in Europe and in North America uh, about robotics, this is the slide that they are really interested in. And what it shows is uh, the total investment in farm equipment for conventional farms and for uh, robotic farms. The blue bars are conventional farms, the orange bars are robotic farms. And you can see for the smallest two farms here, the 66 hectare and the 159 hectare farms. Uh, the orange bar is slightly taller, slightly more investment. And that's because of the retrofit costs for uh, software and hardware for retrofit. But with uh, the, uh, the larger farms, the, uh, the robotic cost curve, the robotic investment required is substantially less, half or a third of what it would be for the conventional cost curve. And just to give you specifics, uh, for the largest farm, uh, the combine uh, on that farm for the conventional farm uh, costs about uh, 300,000 uh, pounds. Uh, in contrast, the, the robotic farm uses three small combines, each of which cost about 30,000 pounds, reducing uh, investment by uh, about two thirds. We've also looked at, and this has been uh, Alamin's uh, work, uh, has been to look at uh, what are, what's the impact of small irregularly shaped fields and we in particular, we use triangularly shaped fields because they're particularly uh, inefficient and there's lots of them in uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, you can see there the, the original cost curves, the blue and the, the golden ones are there. Uh, 
on the, the 10 hectare fields, which are relatively large fields in the United Kingdom. Uh, the, the results are very similar to the baseline uh, with uh, one hectare fields, which would be quite a small field in the United Kingdom. The red line, there's the robotic cost curve and it's slightly above uh, what it would be with 10 hectare uh, fields, but it's still substantially below uh, the conventional uh, cost curve. The black cost curve uh, is uh, much above uh, what it would be with uh, larger fields, and it's only maintainable uh, by using relatively small equipment. Uh, and in the United Kingdom, there's a problem with that simply because finding labor to operate uh, small equipment uh, is, is very, very difficult. So if we talk about field size, uh, the conclusions are that, that autonomous machines are a profitable solution for uh, arable farming in the UK, even if wages increase and there's reduced labor ability. So uh, the, the landscape in the United Kingdom can continue to look like what's in the photo there. It can continue to have irregularly shaped fields with hedgerows uh, that are so beloved by uh, many uh, tourists and people who come to the countryside uh, for, for recreation. This diminishes the pressure on field enlargement. So in the 60s and 70s, there were a lot of hedgerow removal in the United Kingdom, which reduced uh, field biodiversity and created environmental problems. There's less motivation to do that. Uh, field size had the least impact uh, on, uh, on the smallest equipment sets and the autonomous ones are the ones uh, that are most uh, economically feasible. Similarly, uh, we've looked at uh, autonomous uh, regenerative agriculture. And one of the key uh, ideas of re regenerative agriculture is changing uh, crop mix within fields. So instead of having large monocrop fields, there's the idea of doing something else. And that might be strips, it might be patches, it might be intercropping, uh, but automating that has proven a challenge. And there's been a long running project at Wageningen University in the Netherlands uh, on pixel cropping, which would look like uh, the drawing uh, on, on, the, on the right. Uh, but because of differences in plant height and growth pattern, that's a real challenge. We think that strip cropping will be a, uh, at least a, a transitional um, technology that is feasible with uh, current, uh, current equipment. And we've done a little bit of economic analysis there. Uh, Alamine is just working on a study of uh, regenerative two meter strip crops with a rotation of winter wheat, barley, field beans, and grass lay. Uh, and you can see here, uh, the base case here is the blue lines. And so uh, with um, conventional whole, uh, conventional equipment, a uh, whole field uh, on that particular rotation uh, would be very, very, uh, not very profitable. You know, the, this is the return to labor management and, and risk taking. Essentially, this is the, the, the compensation for uh, for the farmer and 14,000 pounds in Britain uh, is not a very good uh, lifestyle. Uh, with conventional cropping uh, at current uh, prices, that's a little bit better. Uh, and strip cropping with robots becomes uh, close to what it would be even with more intensive uh, cropping patterns uh, in, uh, in today's uh, environment. Uh, we've also looked at uh, what happens with uh, a yield increase, and a yield increase can be possible with better soil health, uh, reduced uh, pest uh, management problems, or uh, a cost reduction, the gray bars. And those both uh, either approach or exceed uh, current uh, returns uh, on uh, intensive uh, cropping patterns. Similarly, we looked at this in the United States for maize and soybeans, uh, and there we looked at a very large farm, uh, 2,000 hectare uh, farm, uh, and found that 
uh, strip cropping with uh, autonomous equipment uh, could be quite profitable because it intensifies production. And particularly, it produces uh, substantially more maize because the maize is a taller crop. It has more opportunity to absorb light uh, in a strip cropping uh, pattern. So what are some of those farm practices and the enterprises that could become more economically feasible with robots and artificial intelligence? And uh, the key example is organic uh, crops of all kinds. So weeding labor is a key constraint in most organic production systems, uh, and robotics could help deal with that. But it could also be um, production of heirloom varieties and species that don't adapt well to conventional mechanization. It could be production of all kinds of crops with specific characteristics. So if, if we wanted to produce oilseed rape with a high omega-3 content, uh, we could do that even in fairly small amounts with robotics. And then there's all kinds of herbs, flowers, medicinal plants, and so on uh, that uh, could become uh, economically feasible. For non-mechanized smallholder farmers, a key challenge is the lack of technology so that almost all precision agriculture adoption uh, and has been on large mechanized farms. That's what the technology was initially designed uh, to do. And it, the adoption uh, can move very quickly uh, when uh, it's introduced into countries uh, that have conditions that are similar to those where it was originally developed. So. Um, the example there is yield monitoring in Argentina. Uh, yield monitoring wasn't invented in Argentina, but once it was invented, it became standard practice uh, within a few years. So local adaptive research is essential when those conditions differ substantially from the countries where it originated. Uh, and this is the case for precision ag technology for non-mechanized smallholder farmers. And some of those needs include better information on pest and soil fertility management, um, artificial, artificial intelligence systems that serve the needs of smallholders, and then labor uh, saving systems for small farms. Handheld sensors could revolutionize farm fertilizer management, and they're starting to appear on the market. Uh, smallholder farmers uh, often lack information about the, the type and the amount of fertilizer that their crops need. And so, uh, and in some places that means farmers who don't have very much money to spend don't buy fertilizer at all simply because uh, they, uh, they don't know what's needed. And in other places they may uh, apply uh, too much fertilizer or the wrong kind of fertilizer. Research has shown that there's a potential uh, for handheld nitrogen sensors, and there's been research done in Mexico and in Ethiopia, but the cost of the sensors is still too high. And so the hypothesis that we've come up with is a widespread use of a nitrogen sensor uh, would only occur if the cost is less than about $10 US. And that $10 US uh, comes from research in Bangladesh done at uh, Bangladesh Agricultural University with uh, Professor uh, Sarajul uh, Islam on, on moisture sensors for grains, but similar kind of economic issue. And the second hypothesis is, is that to attain that required price threshold, the sensor would probably be a, a cell phone app or a cell phone uh, accessory. If we're brainstorming the potential for precision agriculture and robotics in developing countries, we need to recognize that the conventional uh, uh, suggestion is often to convert to uh, mechanization with human drivers. But that means to use that effectively, you need large fields, uh, ideally large rectangular fields. And that in other places has meant remaking the rural countryside, uh, you know, removing farmsteads, taking out field boundaries, removing trees. And so the photo there is a Google Earth image of rural uh, Bangladesh, and that happens to be a, a site near Maiman Singh, uh, but I think it's fairly typical. So with small fields, trees, farmsteads, uh, it would be a major, major disruption to convert that 
uh, landscape to um, <clears throat> to uh, conventional mechanization. But what if you could have a robot that uh, could um, uh, help in planting, weeding, and harvesting, and that robot were available uh, at the cost of a motorbike? And in Bangladesh and in many other developing countries, some rural families have motorbikes. So it's, it's, that would be within, uh, within the budget, but it wouldn't require totally remaking uh, the rural landscape. Another aspect of agritech uh, in uh, agriculture is using uh, online mechanisms for purchasing and, and marketing. And in the US and Europe, most farmers purchase some ag inputs online, um, usually with payment by credit card and delivery by truck. And the advantages are lower prices and a wider range of products. Many farmers in the developing world now have cell phones and many uh, will soon have internet access. They could also buy inputs and market output uh, with mobile money payment and uh, delivery by drone, motorbike, trucks. And this is happening in some countries uh, like uh, Kenya with uh, the, the M-Farm uh, program. Another aspect of agritech is the development of high skill employment in rural areas. Uh, we note that large scale mechanized farming requires substantial expertise and enormous amounts of capital. With precision farming and with agritech, that shifts the input mix to still requires some, some substantial uh, capital, but enormous expertise. So the expertise becomes much more uh, important. Uh, some of that expertise will be outsourced via the internet to distant sources, but some will need to be local. And the internet access and electronic tools can allow rural businesses to be uh, competitive. So how would we apply this in the Bangladesh situation? So let's think about what that situation is. So Bangladesh is largely self-sufficient in rice and vegetables, but still imports many other food products. So wheat, cooking oil, pulses. It's been successful in mechanization of uh, primary tillage, particularly with two-wheeled tractors. Uh, most, but most of the crop production, uh, so planting, pesticide application and harvest are, are, are manual. And the conventional solution is field and farm aggregation, but Farmland and land per farm is shrinking in Bangladesh. So let's look at that a little more closely. In Bangladesh, most primary tillage is motorized uh, power tillers with two or four wheel tractors, often owned by uh, contractors who, who do that kind of work uh, for, for farmers. Pesticide application uh, typically seems to be use of human-powered uh, mechanization with hand uh, and knapsack sprayers. Um, less than half of threshing is, seems to be powered uh, by, uh, by either engines or electricity. Uh, Small-scale motorized planting, weeding, spraying, and harvesting machines are available, uh, but they're, they're, not, they're not widely used. And the context of that is uh, rapidly dropping farm labor availability and rising real wages. So the uh, chart there uh, on the, the left is uh, the percent of the labor force in agriculture uh, in several uh, South Asian countries. And you'll note there that the percent of the labor force in agriculture is dropping most rapidly in Bangladesh. It's the lighter blue line. Uh, hardly dropping at all in Nepal. Uh, Pakistan also is very almost constant, but Bangladesh uh, is, is dropping very quickly. And then the real wages uh, from comparing 1995 to 2014 in uh, Maiman Singh, uh, in 1995, uh, farm uh, real wages were about a third of what they are uh, in construction and about half of what it would be in industrial employment. Uh, by 2014, actually the farm wages uh, were slightly higher 
than industrial wages and approaching those in construction. So you have rising real wages uh, and uh, limit, limited uh, farm labor, uh, more limited farm labor availability. And that's on small farms with even smaller fields. So in Bangladesh, the proportion of small farms, that is those less than one hectare is growing. So from uh, the agricultural census uh, in the chart there, we see the blue bars uh, are the percent of farms uh, with that are uh, less, than, uh, less than a hectare uh, are, are growing. Uh, the uh, larger farms are about staying the same and the medium sized farms, the orange bars are, are uh, diminishing. And maybe even more important for the, uh, the question of mechanization is the plot size. So on those small farms, the average plot size in 1996, and there's no indication that they've increased much since then, uh, was 0 0.08 hectares. Um, in North America, uh, that would hardly be room to turn around much of the equipment on the headlands, uh, much less uh, to farm. So this is a real challenge uh, for, for mechanization. Nationally, uh, Bangladesh has set some very ambitious goals to graduate from uh, less developed country status by 2026 and become an upper middle income country by 2031 and achieve high income status by 2041. Um, and transformation of agriculture is a key part of that digital Bangladesh strategy. Digital agriculture is highlighted in the national agricultural policy, and it's needed to achieve the, the, the Ministry of Agriculture vision of sustainable, safe, and profitable uh, agriculture. And there's many initiatives to, to utilize existing technology, but agricultural technology is constantly changing, and it's essential to be aware of the innovations in the horizon and, and incorporate those uh, into the vision when they become available. So a vision for Bangladesh agriculture as we look out into the future beyond current technology. Uh, we see a vision of small scale, relatively low cost robots working with farmers to intensively uh, manage uh, crops. We see diversification of the, the cropping system with alternative crop geometry, and that might be strip cropping, relay cropping, patch cropping. Uh, we see the combination of robotic and mechanical uh, weeding and targeted herbicides uh, resulting in greater field biodiversity, enabling higher yields with lower pesticides. And we see farmers producing a wide range of higher value products and marketing electronically directly uh, to producers and, and consumers. Take home message. So second to the last slide. Precision agriculture and other agritech uh, are already enabling the world to produce more food with less input. But most of that current technology is available only on farms using motorized mechanization. Technology in the pipeline, so on-the-go sensors, crop robotics, artificial intelligence, have the potential to reduce or eliminate pesticide use, facilitate field biodiversity, and create rural entrepreneurship opportunities. Agritech provides all farmers with the tools to be more sustainable, but research, technology development, and entrepreneurship is needed to put those tools into the hands of uh, small older farmers. They, they, they have not been uh, developed yet. Uh, the potential is there. Uh, and I would like to, I look forward to your comments and questions uh, after this presentation about how that might happen. And if uh, you're interested, there's uh, some publications uh, on the slide that look at the general picture uh, for uh, economics of agritech. Uh, and how that might uh, work out. So uh, thank you uh, very much. And I look forward to questions and comments. Thank you uh, very much, um, Professor Luen Bar-Dibor. 
for an excellent and exciting presentation as usual. Um, I would now um, invite uh, comments and questions, but before that, let me welcome uh, Professor Carl Berin, Agritech Economic Modeling Professor at the Harper Adams University who has joined us uh, and now. Um, so very welcome, Professor Berin. Uh, we would also like to hear uh, from you if you have uh, any supplementation or clarification, we'd be very glad to hear from you. Um, you can speak now or you can wait uh, to take a few questions or comments uh, which can feed you to respond probably more clearly. Is that okay? Yes, thank you very much. Um, pleasure to be here and apologies for uh, coming in late. But um, at, at this stage, I think I'll wait to see what happens with the discussion before I contribute anything. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so floor is open now. I would like to um, ask uh, your comments and feedback, but uh, I'm very sorry, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we can have and waste some half an hour so that our minister can come in and speak before us. So go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, um, the host, uh, Ronnie, can you help me? Do you see any hand raised or anything? Uh, could you help me? So, uh, <clears throat> no? At the moment, I don't see anybody. Any, anything? Okay. Yes, uh, there is one, uh, Professor Dr. Haslin Jahan. Okay. She, she has raised. Haslin, quick. Thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, I would like to thank Professor James uh, for his nice presentation and uh, informative uh, lecture. Um, uh, just quickly, I want to make some comments. Like uh, you have showed that the uh, uh, this uh, robotic agriculture or precision agriculture definitely um, uh, proven uh, beneficial for developed country. Uh, but uh, if we think about the Bangladesh context, uh, you have uh, you already mentioned that that labor force is declining, and uh, the real wage is uh, increasing. In this context, uh, obviously, uh, we'd like to uh, test or adapt this technology. But a few, a few um, uh, query, like whether this uh, technology, uh, this precision agriculture is really applicable to the small farm sizes that Bangladesh uh, holds. Uh, the, so we should test the feasibility. Then uh, what kind of uh, skills uh, uh, our, do our main power need to run this kind of technologies? So we also need to uh, test this uh, um, precision agriculture or agri-tech economy, it's the, whether these are economically feasible for our country. And also, uh, um, I think if we import those uh, machineries, it will not be very economically feasible for our country. So whether our local traders or companies be able to develop such kind of machineries. So, um, uh, so uh, in this context, uh, with, uh, I think uh, our government, uh, our private or uh, private organization, or local traders, and also from the um, viewpoint of researchers, our academicians, all should work together uh, right. to uh, test this scope and opportunities. So, Excellent. Thank Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I can see Dr. Ashadul Haq from Agricultural Research Institute, I think. Ashad? Unmute, uh, please yeah. unmute. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Be make your point, yes. please. Yes. Uh, th thank you, sir, uh, for giving me floor. Uh, I want to thanks uh, to Professor for his uh, nice, uh, nice presentation. Actually, uh, in his presentation, he has tried to uh, incorporate all of the modern technologies which will be uh, very necessary for our coming future. Uh, and 
I want to request a uh, team uh, to just to incorporate uh, some more data regarding our small pot and uh, small farming communities. And uh, I want to uh, know from him uh, whether it is possible to get a, a robot with the price of a motorcycle for our farmer for adaptive trial. Actually, rightly we said uh, adaptive uh, research is also important things for uh, robot training. Uh, training of for the robot is important things uh, for the artificial intelligence uh, with for our social and economical aspect and also for our uh, crop and soil condition, we should have some adaptive trial. If you kindly agree to have some experiment like that for our Bangladesh aspect, it will be great. And Thank for you. other aspect, uh, aspect actually, Bangladesh Agricultural Research Institute already have started some activities, some uh, research uh, on image processing, yield forecasting, and also we have some limited research on use of sensors. In case of using sensors, especially for moisture sensor and uh, nitrogen as fertilizer sensor, uh, we have uh, experience uh, for uh, higher price as well as uh, uh, minimum uh, actually accuracy. That's mean not okay. more than seventy percent accuracy. We are uh, we have in Excellent. our findings. So can you have uh, access to supply some innovative and cheap uh, sensors for our country? Thank you, sir, Good. for that. Good. Good, Ashad. Um, I mean, I will hold you up uh, for some time. Let me go to Saipul Islam first. Saipul. Uh, thank you, sir. Yeah, uh, respected head madam, moderator, sir, honorable minister. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and very good evening. At first, I would like to thank as well as congratulate Professor James for an excellent presentation. Actually, I don't have any questions, just kind of a comments I would like to make. Uh, regarding further research, particularly in developing country settings like Bangladesh, to know like how to customize this precision technologies, including robotics technologies. Given our farming characteristics, I would say, as already mentioned, like the small farm we have, even small, smaller than a small, actually, like compared to even within South Asia, we have very small farm size, as well as fragmented land, as well as also financing mechanism because it's access to finance for as an, as an issues offense, as well as also economies of a scale. Then we have already kind of established custom hiring system actually uh, happening, particularly for mechanization, mm -hmm. like power tiller, irrigation, water markets. We have uh, already built in system. So that can work in uh, precision agriculture and robotics as well. So in okay. this respect, I think BAU, Bari, Biri can play, I think, in a pioneer role. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Saipul. Uh, I can see one hand from Iktiar from iFarmer. Uh, Hello? Yeah. Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah please introduce yourself. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Iktiar. I'm from iFarmer, an agrotech company. Uh, working with the farmers on uh, precision agriculture and advisory services. Uh, I just wanted to add to uh, Professor James' excellent point on input soil testing and other matters. Uh, I think uh, we need to concentrate on this very much. We have been doing some research in the northern part of the country, like in Lalmonirhat and Kurigram, and we have been seeing that uh, the fertilizer usage fertilizer application is uh, uh, very much out of sync with the, uh, with the recommendation by BRC, Agriculture Research Council. So they are, now with our help, uh, they are uh, doing proper fertilizer application. And now in last two seasons, uh, the cost is decreasing significantly without affecting the yield. And also one more point here is that we have seen the soil fertility level is decreasing because of this uh, unusual kind of fertilizer application. 
So I think uh, this soil testing thing should be prioritized in the country so that the uh, soil fertility is restored or uh, keep in a condition that is helpful for long-term fertilizer. Thank you, sir. Excellent. Uh, I can see a hand from Mohammad Adnan. Adnan? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. okay. And thank you, Honorable Moderator, for yeah, giving me the opportunity. It, it, I am Soil Adnan. Okay. I am uh, I am uh, uh, calling from Japan. Um, thank you, uh, Honorable uh, Chief Guest, uh, Honorable Agriculture Minister of People's Republic. Uh, uh, thanks to Honorable Presenter for the excellent presentation. Um, yes, uh, I also support and endorse uh, with this uh, emerging technology the um, for regulation and this cutting edge uh, technology where AI, IoT and smart uh, farming, how they are contributing to smart agriculture. And as we have seen the other countries like Japan and other countries, uh, how they are contributing to, to liking planning, scheduling and optimization of process, especially in agriculture. Um, especially um, uh, when other countries are highly associated with this agriculture. So time is not that much far that Bangladesh will contribute to this sustainable intensification of a small hold agriculture by this uh, precision system and uh, cutting edge technology. Uh, I myself actually, I'm not uh, uh, just my comment that uh, I was uh, conducting a research and recently just finished uh, agriculture associated with precision mapping for pumpkin pumpkin uh, during the harvest. Uh, while I was uh, using the drone, the advanced drone, the Phantom 4, RTK drone for detecting the object detection and image processing for the pumpkin flowers. Um, I was uh, 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 counting the flowers manually, then I took uh, aerial uh, photos from the drone aerial view, uh, which I actually taken photos for 20, 15 to 20 meters. So that was my findings that I could capture some uh, aerial views from 15 meters point, uh, about 50% of manual flowers I could detect. So like 100 flowers in manually and I uh, took 50, get 50 flowers from aerial view. So this percentage could be improved. It is my uh, feedback uh, and uh, my um, actually ob uh, my observation that if I could take the drone uh, much more the lower part than 15 meters, but because technologically some and some manufacturing, I could not operate uh, more uh, clear to more near to the pumpkins. So some flowers are hidden by small or something, but whatever, uh, what I have uh, right. get the fifty percent that has increased the chance of uh, yield. So that is my comment. That how uh, we saw the how the smart agriculture is shaping the sustainable uh, agriculture and profitability. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Alamin, uh, could you come now? Thank you, sir for giving me the chance. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay, I have two questions to James, even though I talked uh, all times with James, but it's, uh, this is the questions for all, to, to have the ideas for all, all audience. The question is the prime concern of Bangladesh. As we know that Bangladesh is self-sufficient uh, in production, for instance, rice and some cereal crops production. But the main concern of Bangladesh agriculture is the economics of production as, as we termed ourselves as subsistence. So that was not our prior concern for the last, for the very beginning of the birth of Bangladesh to the last first, last three decades, Bangladesh concentrated on, on the transitional agriculture. So in that sense, economics of agricultural production is important. And, and we know that Bangladesh has competitive advantage in terms of growing seasons. We grow the three times in a year uh, compared to the importing country from where we uh, usually import wheat, uh, soybeans, and others like uh, Russia, Ukraine, Canada, and USA, except the uh, issue of economies, of economies of size. 
So how could uh, Agritech help Bangladesh uh, to be self-sufficient uh, in terms of these issues? How Bangladesh can capitalize its uh, uh, potentialities uh, to be self-sufficient uh, to feed her uh, growing populations? And another issue is, as Professor Hasnin rightly mentioned about the uh, cost of the equipments, how you suggest Bangladesh agriculture, including startup like Hello Tractor in Afri Africa, how Bangladesh could embrace agrotex with the such kind of startup notions? And another leading point is, okay. Professor, uh, leading point is Iftekar from iPharma mentioned about the targeted applications. Bangladesh is highly subsidized in input, for instance, uh, synthetic chemicals. And we have problems when we talk about the markets of products, about the safe production, how safe uh, grain production, input applications, and agri-tech can come up with synergies to solve the, to solve the problem of Bangladesh agriculture uh, from okay. the transition from subsistence to commercial. Thank you. Excellent, uh, Alamin. Um, I can see, let me take uh, two more, really. I can see hand. Um, Dr. Nahid Sattar is with us. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, Honorable Minister, Chairperson, uh, Professor James, uh, greetings to all. Uh, thank you very much for the very good discussion that is, has been going on. I just have a quick comment. That is, of course, the, the type of technologies we are talking about are important for Bangladesh, and eventually we will be needing a use of uh, robotics and different uh, advanced technologies that we are talking about. And definitely they will have certain cost advantages and advantage in production. I think to me, the more important question is, is the pathway, right? Uh, it's about choosing what sort of technologies would come first, what sort of technologies we are ready for adopting now. And then uh, sort of uh, that would uh, create an enabling environment for other sort of technologies to be adopted and uh, to, to spread in agriculture of Bangladesh. So to me, the, the more important question here is that how we lead towards more sustainable mechanization. And of course, we, we need all sorts of things. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. I can see a um, hand raised by Dr. Khandagar Elahi. Khandagar Elahi is from Goyal University in Canada, who is now in Bangladesh. Uh, yeah. Elahi, are you with us? Yes, I am with you. OK, please. Well, Thank you. And make your comment. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator. Uh, my name is Kondakar Kutruti Alahi. I, I lived in Bangladesh. I, I, was, I was a graduate from my Bangladesh University and I taught there, but uh, I left the uh, country in 1996 and living in Canada. So the, my first thing is that whether I, I should consider myself as qualified to raise any question. I don't have uh, much knowledge about what is going on in Bangladesh, but still, then I have some uh, some uh, some questions about the use of intensification. When uh, we are uh, studying agriculture economics, so intens intensification what is usually used for input, not output. So I don't know what is the justification for using this uh, word uh, in uh, in the context of output or. Um, that is improved production. Second uh, point that has been made is about the real OS increase. Now, I th uh, I th uh, it is quite economic that when uh, general economic condition improves or growth improves, the real uh, OSS increases. This is supposed to increase in the, also in the uh, agriculture sector. The, that means it should not be taken as a negative um, uh, negative um, factor that is ca causing agricultural development or uh, agricultural production. Finally, the, the thing that I uh, would rest, uh, like to know from Professor James is what I heard about here is about all the technologies are used in UK and other countries and their farm size is, um, uh, you know, the small price is less than 100 hectares. Now, you also show us that 
the small farm size in, uh, in Bangladesh is 0 0.08 hectare. Now the question is how this labor reducing technologies can be used in Bangladesh and who is going to finance them. And from when I talk, uh, think about uh, government perspective, one of the most important, uh, important uh, policy issue in the government is to increase the uh, employment level in, in rural areas so that uh, they can have a decent, uh, 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 decent uh, living standard. So when the whole economy is growing and everybody's uh, um, enjoying very good uh, standard of living, our laborers, agricultural laborers are also supposed to do the same thing. And it should not be taken as a negative effect on production. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, thank you. Um, I think uh, let us uh, call it the first slot. And uh, let me go back to um, Professor Lauenberg de Boer for his uh, quick response and then a supplement from Professor Carl Berendt. And let's see what happens. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Mandal. Uh, and lots of uh, very good comments uh and 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 questions and um uh, some of them are are related to one another so i'll i'll try and hit hit the the high points um i think one of the the key questions uh that's been raised is about uh the cost of uh the equipment uh and the potential for local manufacturing um i think uh we need to remember the history of uh ICT technology and other kinds of electronic technology. And I think here the, the, the mobile phone case is a good, uh, a good example. When it was first introduced uh, in uh, the United States in the 1970s, um, the, mobile, the first mobile phones cost uh, about $3,000 and they were uh, quite awkward and clumsy uh, to use. Over time, they become much smaller and much, much cheaper so that um, in many parts of the world, it's possible to buy a mobile phone for the equivalent of, of uh, $20. And so uh, if we think about that in the robotics case, yes, robots uh, in many cases are uh, quite expensive now, but with economies of scale in manufacturing uh, and with further developments, that cost can, can come down. Is there po potential for local manufacturing uh, in Bangladesh? And I would say uh, definitely yes, especially for uh, the uh, specialized equipment that are needed for Bangladeshi conditions. So uh, I think the, the most likely outcome is that there will be uh, general platforms in the same way that, that tractors are now manufactured uh, in India and in other places in, in China for use all over the world. But in those specific uh, locations where they're used, they, they're used with specific uh, implements and tools. And so clearly the development of those implements and tools uh, locally uh, is, uh, is, a, is a big opportunity for Bangladesh uh, entrepreneurs. Also the training. And someone in the, the comments made a, a comment about the need uh, for, for uh, training. I think it was Dr. Hauk. Um, and, and this will be uh, an important, again, uh, an important opportunity for local entrepreneurs to train the artificial intelligence for the specific needs of uh, Bangladeshi, uh, Bangladeshi farmers. In terms of, of skills requirements, um, Clearly, uh, there will be skills requirements for uh, the technicians uh, who uh, will be uh, in charge of maintaining and repairing uh, robots. But we hope, just like with mobile phones, um, that uh, the use of them uh, will become easier over time. And so uh, I've worked a lot in, in Africa, and I've seen many 
illiterate African farmers who use mobile phones just fine. They use them for their marketing. They use them for um, input purchasing. Uh, and so uh, we hope that, and the, the idea is that the technology become easy, becomes easier to use. So yes, there's a need for skills uh, for uh, those who uh, develop uh, robotic technology and maintain and repair it. Uh, but for the end user, uh, we think uh, that it will become uh, much, much uh, easier, uh, easier to use. To uh, respond to the, the question about uh, the economics of production and how agritech could help uh, Bangladesh reach self-sufficiency, um, in economics, self-sufficiency is, is a risk management uh, approach. Um, and uh, it's not always desirable. Uh, it's always good to have some self-sufficiency in, in food in particular because of disruptions in uh, supply chains and so on, uh, but um, it may not be absolute self-sufficiency in everything, but clearly Agritech can help uh, Bangladesh uh, diversify uh, its agricultural economy uh, to produce uh, more of the, uh, the oil seeds and other products that uh, it is uh, current, currently, uh, currently importing. The um, question uh, from uh, Nahid uh, Satar about the pathway to transform Bangladeshi agriculture. That I think is a really, really uh, Im important issue and is maybe the most complex thing that we have so far uh, been, been discussing because it's one thing to have a vision for where an agricultural sector is going. It's quite another uh, to uh, understand enough of the details and enough of the nuances to predict what would be the best pathway. Uh, but uh, we know that in, uh, in developed countries, uh, we're expecting to see retrofitted uh, conventional technology, which will then uh, pave the way for uh, uh, original equipment, uh, autonomous uh, equipment, and and other other technology. So that's an area that really really needs study. So uh, I look forward to continuing uh, contact with with all of you. But uh, thank you very much for those comments. Excellent. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, Sadid Jamil from Metal, are you still with us? And do you have any anything to add? No question, but I, what I understand from Professor James is very interesting that robotic technology is coming to Bangladesh, maybe in future. So uh, we are now, you know, for the harvest, uh, we are still lagging behind for uh, uh, mechanization. But for land preparation, it is almost done. So this robotic technology has come. It is very uh, we uh, uh, we welcome this technology. Let's see what happens. Only Thank the you. problem is our access to finance. Finance is a problem. But let's see. We'll see. Okay. How it goes. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Okay. I had a word with someone from the Bangladesh Bank only uh, day before yesterday, and uh, there will be a dialogue. Uh, between this private sector and then banks really very soon, hopefully. Yes. The central bank is not giving- yeah. No, know. no. Yeah, but they, they are- Plans doing, for have, the-, the organization. Yeah. I know. Thank you. Um, Honorable Minister, let me know from you about your um, availability. Is it uh, high time already or you can give us a few more minutes? Yeah, please unmute, Honorable Minister. I can't hear you. Please unmute. Yeah, unmute. Yes. Yes. Uh, can you can you give us a few more minutes or ten more minutes uh, before I? You want to listen, somebody or?
Yeah, but that's what I am uh, trying to give some. I think I heard <laughs> enough. <laughs> you, you can continue. After I... Okay, but let, let me uh, give. After uh, I leave. Uh, just, just give me, allow me to um, welcome uh, Professor Carl Bennett if he has any supplement or add. He is from the Harper Adams University. Oh, okay. That's okay. Professor Bennett. Thank you, Professor Mendel. Um, so the the only comment I would I would make in in supplement potentially with um, what Professor Lomborg de Boer discussed. Uh, is this question about labour and equipment cost. And, and as we all know, what has evolved in many countries is the situation where farmers themselves may not actually own the equipment. And there's we could create an environment where there's a real opportunity for entrepreneurs to enter the robotic space and provide services to more than one farmer. And um, facilitating that and having the policies in place to enable that and support that could be quite useful and help accelerate Bangladesh towards a robotic AI-based um, farming sector. Um, I, I think that's um, thinking about different ways of potentially enabling the implementation and adoption of this technology at a much broader scale um, and especially uh, given the the, um, the difficulties with meeting the costs of of some of this um, technology, so that would be my only comment. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so before I um, switch over to um, our honourable minister, um, let me uh, bring uh, to his notice uh, as a matter of supplement and uh, that. This scale economy is a very important issue that whether or not our small farm size um, uh, can, can utilize or adopt these machines that we are talking about. That was the debate or big question some 40 years ago as well. Really. But then what we have seen then from the middle of 80s, there was this green revolution technology to cope with these irrigation farms, really. Then also we face this question that whether or not our small farms can have access to these and things. But what we saw that not all of our uh, farmers had to buy their own machine or own pumps. There were these water sellers or the pump entrepreneurs, really, who installed their tube walls and he started selling this water services business really. So that ultimately took a shape of more of formalized uh, literature like uh, custom hiring service really with two wheel tractors and four wheel tractors. And now at the end, now these uh, combined harvester really. And so the entrepreneurs have come in and they can move from place to place, from plot to plot. Really. So a smallness of farm size has actually been uh, um, resolved uh, by the operational consolidation of a small size plots really by a group of entrepreneurs. And that is a subject that I have uh, written in my paper, which is coming um, in the Journal of um, a Review of Agrarian uh, Studies uh, very soon. Uh, I'm a co-author with uh, Professor uh, Wood of um, Bath University in the UK. So that, that, that's the question of fragmentation. Okay, we would be very happy to have a larger size farm or larger fragment, but reality is that we own and if this trend goes, and there is no reason why it won't, uh, the average size of flowers will still uh, come down from, from uh, 0.08 hectare to probably 0.05 hectare and even further 
as time goes. So we don't have to uh, really take that upfront anymore. Rather, the custom hiring or this operational consolidation of this smallness of plots, which have begun already with high value crops, with rice and everything we are doing. Good thing is that Ministry of Agriculture has started a synchronization farming system in, in a number of places. And many of our colleagues will be there with me. Uh, they have begun that really. And in some places it has uh, done reasonably well. I won't say that everything is fine. Or reasonably. So that, that's how we have to overcome that problem. Problem is that bringing efficiency, cost reduction, of the machine or the technology itself, really. Okay, so um, um, I would now ask our Honorable Minister, Dr. Mohammad Abdul Rajjar, to um, give his deliberation. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Mm. I thank uh, Bangladesh Agriculture University. Uh, and uh, Professor Dr. Hasnin Jahan, uh, Department of Agriculture University, BU, and today's um, seminars moderator, Dr. M. A. Sattar Mondol, he is an eminent uh, economist, emeritus professor of BU, and Presenter, Professor James Loenberg Deboer. He's a professor of Harper Adam University, UK. Distinguished participants. I feel really honored to have this opportunity to participate in this seminar. Uh, I think. Uh, it's an opportunity uh, to know, to learn about Cardi's technologies, particularly we are in a, when we are in a process of uh, mechanization of our agriculture. We have been practicing traditional agriculture for quite long and still uh, we are practicing. Most of the practices are manual or we are using still animal power. So I consider this uh, seminar is extremely important. As you entitled AgriTech Key to Sustainable Intensification of such smallholder agriculture in Bangladesh. On an average, uh, most of the farmers are smallholder in Bangladesh, as you have uh, given the statistics, point uh, eight hectares, point zero eight hectares. It's extremely small when we can compare it with Western large farmers. It was an excellent presentation by uh, Professor James Lohenberg. <coughs> Very detailed, comprehensive, with a lot of information. I was feeling that I am in a, a class with a renowned eminent professor. Uh, <laughs> I was really learning. It has obviously upgraded my understanding about latest technologies available to modernize our farming and enhance productivity and in income or profit. And I feel encouraged and I feel all the participants feel encouraged that Bangladesh being the least developed or a developing country, they have uh, uh, this uh, technology is, has prospect, it offers prospect for Bangladesh. 
we shall be able to use those technologies. While we have been, we have started to use a combined harvester, which, which costs $30,000. You are saying that one robot, it will cost us only a more cost of a motorbike. That's $1,000. So our farmers, they're investing $30,000, 30 motorbike. And there is a demand. Demand is very high. Every day I get uh, approved from our, even public leader, political public representative. He would, they would say that the farmers in his area, they need more combined harvester, they're interested to buy. So I should allocate more. There is a, we cannot, uh, we cannot fulfill the demand. So we have to allocate combined harvesters. As you said that our tilling is fully now mechanized. Then we talk about uh, threshing, it's also mechanized. Plantation, just we have started, we could not fully achieve the plantation, particular rice and other crops with machines. Let's see. Traditionally, we call Bangladesh subsistence agriculture. Still, it is subsistence. Many farmers, they produce to eat, produce, meet their family needs with a small margin, small uh, yeah, surplus. But uh, opportunities are, if opportunity comes, it go, and we adapt slow, but it's being adapted. But I feel very encouraged seeing the interest of our farmer in machines. Given or against the backdrop of uh, reduced uh, labor availability, and cost is quite high. Let me give you an example from the field this year. Our main uh, second important rice crop is we call tea almond, transplanted almond. It's being harvested now. It's our uh, we are starting with winter and. Uh, relatively dry. They can keep uh, rice in the field for a few days. There is no chance of damage from rain or other natural calamities. But still, uh, there is a shortage of labor. And price uh, wage is quite high and unaffordable. Sometimes it's uh, uh, incurring uh, loss for the farmers they cannot have. So we have to go for mechanizations. And question is uh, on mechanization, farmers they cannot have. We, if we want to make our agriculture profitable, if you want to make it commercialized, we are saying that our main focus, main objective to um, commercialize our agriculture or through mechanization and adapting modern uh, technologies. When we talk about artificial intelligence, robot and other technologies, we are much behind. But when we, I learned, I know from your presentation or uh, from other literature, that it would not cost that high a nitrogen application or fertilizer application. So precisely, it would save my nitrogen and reduce the cost and also labor. And I get a precision there. So it needs kind of awareness, motivation, then I believe uh, if our government policy stands uh, beside, 
the farmers with uh, some support. It should not be very difficult. I saw so many hands after your presentation. It has generated a lot of interest <laughs> and also stimulating us, those who we work with the poor farmer who has been over his practicing subsistence farming. We are, we are claiming or we are in a transition. Mm, we are in a transition. We said that uh, first wave, first wave of agricultural transformation that we started with the call from our founding father that we call um, call for uh, a green revolution. We started giving, uh, providing seeds of high yielding varieties, introduction of uh, modern HIV high yielding varieties, then providing irrigation, providing chemical inputs and uh, other chemicals. That was the first wave of agricultural transformation. And that has increased production and productivity. We won't be able to feed our 165 million people with the level of productivity we had 30, 40 years ago. And we have been supporting our uh, farmers in, by formulating many policies and strategies. In recent days, uh, present government uh, came, uh, got the responsibility to assume responsibility to govern this country in 2008 with overwhelming support from the people. We gave it, we promised, we placed to the people to all. We placed to the people through our election manifesto and our vision document 2001 that will make our country self-sufficient in the food, latest by 2015, will be achieving all the MDG goal by two, concluding year of MDG 2015. And we are very much on track and we achieved that. Most of the all, all eight uh, MDG goal are received by 2017. And we are very much on track on SDG to make this country so, uh, to reduce poverty, then achieve food security and ensure uh, supply of safe food. Towards that goal, we have uh, taken a number of initiatives uh, and we are providing all out support. We have National Agricultural Policy 2018, Extension Policy 2020, Mechanization Policy 2020, Good Agricultural Practice. You have been saying precision agriculture or good practice. We have also uh, formulated good gap policy. Then Mujib Climate Prosperity Plan and Bangladesh Delta Plan 2001. Probably you know that Bangladesh is the largest delta. And it's always very vulnerable to natural calamities, natural disasters. But we have uh, planned with technical assistance from Netherlands. We have formulated Delta Plan 2001, and we have started to implement that. Uh, 
and we are on our third tenure of the present government under the leadership of our Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. Always we envision that we will be self-sufficient in food, at least in food grain. And we you will be happy to note that we have increased uh, production by 10 million tons in last 13, 14 years. It was uh, 29 million ton in 2008. We have increased it to 38 million ton. Altogether, uh, wheat, uh, maize, and rice, all together is 45 million tons. Maize was not a crop in Bangladesh. It was introduced as a new crop with the rise of uh, commercial poultry farm, dairy farm, and cattle farm. Demand for maize is increasing. And we are producing about 6 million, 6 million tons of uh, maize that we are feeding to our animal and we are converting it into protein and other nutritious yeah, nutrients. But we have to spare land for those crops, for growing, for raising, culturing fish, for cattle, for poultry farm. Just I give you a statistics. In 2009, vegetable production was 3 million ton, only 3, 3 million ton. Now we are producing vegetables about 21, 22 million tons. Seven time increase in just vegetable production. So our economy is growing and we claim that is so in one in decade, we are the first growing economics of the one of the first growing economics of the world. In agriculture, we are we rank third in rice production. And we are also producer of number of crops. Ten top ten producer among we are among 10 top producer of five six crops like potato mango vegetables and then fish and so on now i can come to our challenge how to sustain this production and meet the ever growing population while land area and other resources like water is alarmingly shrinking. Another challenge, that's uh, climate change, emerging challenge, global warming, and its adverse impact on environment for, and also our agriculture production system, farming system. I was carefully listening your <laughs> presentation. You gave so much information. And while I see that uh, gradually we are going for mechanization, it's, uh, we are in the process of trans transformation. But technology you have been talking about, 
in this nation of smallholder agriculture. I think uh, we can adapt those and uh, our people are not much aware of it, even our uh, professional agriculture farming community. It's a good, it would be a good beginning. Some of our uh, young scientists, young, they got uh, award Indonesia recently for their achievement for using robot. They have innovated some robotic farming. And some farmers, some entrepreneurs, they went to it, uh, modern greenhouse and using cutting edge technologies. So it may take time, but government has always highest priority in agricultural in agricultural development. And always we claim that it's paying off present government without such concentrated effort we wouldn't be able to feed our uh, people we wouldn't be able to self-sufficient in at least uh, food grain idea of using autonomous autonomous machine re-engineered for small farms and suited to our social economic and environmental context you have tried to show us that it will suit to our environment that's a good part of your uh, presentation that was excellent at least myself i'm convinced that this equipment will suit to our environment. Precision agriculture technology using global positioning system, sensors, satellites, and drones are also needed to be re-engineered. This essentially commensurate with the ATP drive, which puts this transforming using fourth industrial revolution. Bangladesh government plan to establish my village, my town. Our town as our village, these days, uh, livelihood of the village area has improved and standard of living is improving. So from this technology, um, there will be a village area, rural area will be benefited. I also support to having a suitable business model in order to market such technology to a large number of smallholders maintaining their affordability. I see the research initiatives taken up in the developed world, especially the hand-free actor project in the United Kingdom, very interesting. To be honest, it's a new terminology to me, hand-free hand. Then what do I do with my hand? <laughs> Except eating and do some personal work. Recently, I came to know that a group of our, as I said, in Bangladesh has developed robot farmers and earned gold medal in a global competition held in Indonesia. The challenge now is to convert these insights into practical products to plant, wheat and harvest and market a crop to be marked for the cost far less than a motorbike. Only then it would be worthwhile for small holders. Our scientists and youth could be involved in such initiatives. Uh, Professor James, I appreciate again. Uh, I thank you for, for your excellent presentation. It will create a lot of, it has created a lot of inter interest and almost our professional who are engaged in agriculture research and development they will keep up their effort
to know more and uh, they should uh, make it. how we can use this technology we adopt this technology that's important as a minister i like to assure you i'll take up this issue there's agri tech key to sustainable in this vision of small holder agriculture in bangladesh and at the, at the policy level we'll uh, formulate some favorable policies so that we become the one of the first first adapter of, of available technologies we suit to our environment farmers plotters small but we are trying to synchronize the plantation and harvest so that we can use big combined harvester to harvest a rice field that we have been doing so always uh, farmers are innovative and they try to adapt and adjust we know we have a limitation in fund fund affordability is less but government will provide support for modernizing our farming system and to make our farming more productive and profitable thank you for thank you waiting with chief guest thank you ladies and gentlemen thank you very much uh, honorable minister for your brilliant comment and very incisive observation and your very generous assurance that uh, under your leadership your government will try to frame uh, appropriate policies and will remain as supportive as you have been uh, in the past so i will wind up with a few of conclusive remarks but before that i would like to give uh, a chance to professor Lawenberg de Boer if you have any conclusive uh, statement of Thank you uh, professor uh, Mandal and thank you honorable minister for uh, your comments um uh, thank you everyone for listening and for the comments uh, and and questions um I think uh, I'd like to go back to the the issue about uh, the pathway toward transformation of Bangladesh agriculture. And one of the things that uh, we always uh, would tell uh, farmers in um, in 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 the U.S. that before buying new technology, it's always best to do uh, the the analysis first to uh, to look at what the potential is where. The potential bottlenecks are, and uh, I think um, uh, at Harper and at uh, BAU uh, there are ag economists ready to to help Bangladesh uh, look at what what that pathway might look like. So, thank you very much, and I look forward to uh, further uh, contact and discussion with you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... <clears throat> for your conclusive uh, statement. Um, we have um, almost come to an end. Um, almost come to an end. Um, so my conclusive remarks would be that there is um, no uh, difference or disagreement with the large scale mechanization um, in a smallholder Bangladesh agriculture, but then we have to shift from automation to artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, and then crop robotics and so on and so forth. But that uh, brings us uh, to the issue of increasing need for research and development or R&D 
Uh, and for that, there is a responsibility on behalf of the government to um, come up with um, budgetary resources to support the science community. But also I would like to invite the private sector, uh, uh, business and then innovators to come and join this process of R&D, uh, which will be mutually a win-win uh, situation for both of us. And that will reduce the cost of production per unit of uh, whatever product uh, that farmers uh, produce, together with efficiency gain uh, and an increase of total factor productivity, who is very nicely defined by Professor Lam and Bag de Boer as TFP means using the inputs uh, better. And that is what we need. And that is what could be achieved, as I understand, by this um, uh, robotic uh, uh, technology and an artificial intelligence uh, that we look forward to. Uh, it's a very remarkable evidence that you produce that the cost curve for wheat production um, reduced by 50% when robotics or robotic technology was used compared to conventional technology. So that is the type of uh, evidence uh, which inspire us. We, we look forward to doing more about it. Uh, so thank you very much um, indeed, uh, Professor Lavenberg de Boer, and also later on uh, joined by uh, Professor um, uh, Carl uh, Beren, um, my colleagues, um, honorable minister, uh, private sector friends, uh, our postgraduate students, our colleagues from the research, both from home and abroad. It has been a wonderful uh, session. I have enjoyed thoroughly and look forward to doing more like this. So uh, over to you, Professor Hasnin Jahan, uh, to um, finally uh, conclude uh, this webinar. So thank you very much from me. Again, good evening from Bangladesh. Good night, Bangladesh. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, uh, moderator sir, for very efficiently uh, moderated these sessions, as well as uh, I would like to thank Professor James for your very informative uh, session. And I would like to thank our honorable Minister of Agriculture for uh, have, um, uh, for being with us for such a long time and give very positive uh, feedback and informative feedback from Bangladesh perspective as well. So I think it will open up the avenue for uh, make a bridge and linking to for uh, that uh, Harper Adams University from your expertise, uh, Professor James, and um, from Bangladesh, our sites will try to adopt these technologies in Bangladesh context as we already yeah, we got a very uh, assurance from our honorable minister and private sectors are also there. So our academicians and researchers are, are also here. So uh, I hope uh, uh, with all our effort and uh, um, we can make a positive change to the agriculture of Bangladesh. So uh, I would uh, lastly, uh, I express my gratitude and would like to thank all of you uh, to join this webinar. And uh, I wish you good health to everybody and uh, welcome you for the future webinar of our department. Thank you very Thank much. You. And good Thank you. Thank you. Professor James, I look forward to seeing you in Bangladesh, to meet you in Bangladesh. No, I hope so. Harper University, Harper University, and we can work together. Well, that's a wonderful uh, <laughs> assurance. So you appreciate, Honorable Minister. Thank you very much indeed. And we look forward to more cooperation and collaboration between our universities. And I extend open invitation to Professor <laughs> James Thank to visit. Wonderful.
Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.